Euh, ouais. Je pense plus ouvert, mais euh, parce que Zoom, tu peux faire euh, live que sur euh, Facebook, il y a une audience moins qualifiée. Nous passons en live, maintenant. nous passons en live, je, je vous laisse. Ah. So welcome everybody. I'm gonna I'm going to start. Um, I hope you can all see us. Sorry, we're a bit late because uh, it's the first time we're using this live um, session on LinkedIn. Um, so welcome to the fifth edition of France uh, versus Silicon Valley. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, rethinking digital sovereignty. Uh, this live session is organized by the French American Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm Laurence. I'm the executive director uh, of the French American. Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with magazine Challenge, um, which is the first business magazine uh, in France. So Gilles Fontaine, uh, who is here and will be here in a few minutes, uh, will moderate the session. Um, I want to thank our speakers, uh, uh, Jérôme Leca and uh, Nicolas Riel, for being here today. Um, our goal is to build bridge between France and Silicon Valley, so we'll try to bring leaders uh, from France and leaders from Silicon Valley. So today is really an example. Um, of what of what we do, um, and we're very honored to have you and welcome you today. Uh, so I'm not going to be very far, <laughs> very long. Uh, I just want to thank our sponsors, um, so Capgemini, uh, Bank of the West, and SalesforceWork.com for for supporting us because we're a nonprofit organization. So their support is really important to us. Um, on that, I'm uh, going to give the floor to to Gilles and the speakers. Uh, you have a chat, so on LinkedIn you can also comment everything, and we'll ask uh, all the questions uh, at the end of the discussion. So thank you very much, everybody, and, and have a nice session. Thank you. Thank you, Laurence. Um, it's, uh, it's very good to have you, and, and sorry for the delay. As uh, Laurence said, we're uh, testing a new uh, platform. Uh, we were previously on Zoom, and we're trying to, um, you know, create a kind of a better experience. So that wasn't a big success so far, I think. <laughs> We're working on it, and I, th I hope you'll enjoy the. I hope you'll enjoy the show, the discussion with um, our uh, very interesting speakers tonight. Uh, we're, uh, as Ron said, we're uh, doing this uh, seventh uh, session on digital sovereignty, uh, and and it's a kind of a big issue here in France, where uh, politicians, uh, uh, business leaders. Uh, are really you know on on that matter since probably even even more since the the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis um, and um, well we'll we'll talk about that uh, you know in, in detail with our, our uh, with Jérôme and and, and Nicolas uh, it's it's a big issue in France we were seeing the that uh, of of course with what happens with with Asia and China and and and. Uh, and uh, we're seeing also this this matter is growing in the U.S. with the uh, uh, Donald Trump against uh, versus uh, TikTok and and the Chinese um, social networks. Um, uh, so we'll have a lot to to say. But I will like to introduce quickly our two um, uh, speakers uh, today. Uh, Nicolas Rieu is um, a president of uh, the French chapter of the Interactive Advertising Board. And Jérôme Leca is, uh, is the CEO of uh, Scality. Uh, so Jérôme is, um, of course, is, is, has moved to Silicon Valley for, I don't know, maybe 20 years now. He'll tell us more about that. But he got famous over here in France of, uh, maybe a, a, a few years ago when François Hollande was um, uh, president of, uh, President de la République. Uh, and uh, President uh, Hollande made a, a visit to Silicon Valley. Uh, and uh, Jérôme at that time pointed out the, the real problems with French entrepreneurs and the, 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 you know, the disparity, the, the difference that uh, how Americans and French address, you know, different matters, how you treat entrepreneurs in, in both sides of, of the Atlantic and, and how also you treat research and researchers on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, Jérôme, the floor is yours. Um, maybe you can give us a little feedback of, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, little event uh, when you 
met your moment of celebrity a few years ago and, and uh, what happened at that time and, and uh, what has improved or not since, since, since then. Thank you, Gio. Thank you. Uh, I, I like to be known for the success of Skeleti, but for this time, we focus on that moment in the life. Um, so yeah, it was in 2014, so six years ago now. Uh, and when uh, François Hollande came, um, I, I got to reflect upon uh, what I was seeing in Silicon Valley, what I was seeing in France, what I was seeing in the world. Uh, for me, it, it's been obvious for many, many years that as a result of the digital transformation, the change of how work and play is being done, uh, essentially the whole IT computing telecom industry is becoming more and more important in the competitivity of enterprise, but also of countries. And it was already obvious that the large players are American. Uh, since then, I would say that there are more large players that are also Chinese and that uh, France and Europe in general had very few large players. And what does it mean if you look at this, you know, looking forward um, with a longer perspective, it means that the quality of the jobs that will be uh, available in France will not be as interesting as the quality of the jobs that are where there is the thinking, the think tank, the, the really thinking of the dominant players in a given industry. So with, with that change of economic value being more and more IT and software, unless we're able in France and Europe to build some dominant players uh, in uh, software and IT, we won't be able to retain the best jobs in the world. Okay, so that, that was the extent of uh, what I was saying in 2014. Um, a lot has happened uh, since then, a lot of good, uh, but honestly also a lot of negative forces as well. And I think that the, unfortunately the balance goes for more negative forces. So on the good side, uh, Really, the French tech in France has had an incredible movement. Um, entrepreneurs are now really shown on TV, which was not the case. Uh, there's been also a lot of financing of French tech companies, uh, billions of euros of financing. Um, there are many, uh, you know, famous unicorn, I think about 13 unicorns in France. So that's, that's all very positive. At the same time, I would say that the world has evolved for less cooperation between the, the major powers, and I'm thinking especially um, three major powers, um, America, US, uh, Europe, and China, which has emerged now as a, uh, as a third uh, superpower, including in the IT and the internet uh, business. Um, less cooperation uh, leading to this, this more and more thinking of sovereignty, and, and seriously right now, uh, Europe is not doing well. I mean, if for any reason America was to say uh, we don't want to ship any more um, components or software to Europe, uh, Europe would not be able to be self-sustainable and would not be able to continue operating its industries. I mean, from just basic processors to servers, some servers are manufactured in China, but they still need the processors, uh, to most of the software, not even counting uh, the cloud infrastructure, because most of our most of the leading cloud infrastructure in the world is uh, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure, and uh, Google, and you know uh, we have very few large players in Europe. So I think that um, th there's a lot being done, and and we're really far. And one of the things that I witness is a significant difference on how America, US uh, helps their um, their startups and how Europe is doing it. Obviously, there's financing. And, and let's say that we're almost equal now on financing. I mean, you, you, you can find money in the US, you can find money in Europe as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, but then really what makes a startup grow is not the financing it receives from a financial institution. Uh, it's not even help that you receive from the state. It's orders from customers. And this is a place where uh, the US has been extremely strong giving orders from its um, DAPA program, so that's a, a, a program for the Department of Defense uh, from the military arm of the country, uh, gives a lot of orders to the startups to foster the development of new technology and new products being used in real. Um, and the, the, the equivalent of that in Europe doesn't exist. What the Europe does is that they give some kind of uh, help for more R&D, 
but the, the like, take the Horizon 2020 program from the EU, uh, you get to do a lot of R&D with university, but it's not real. Um, at Scality, we actually participated in two of these uh, Horizon 2020 programs. It's fascinating. It's From an intellectual standpoint, it's great, but you don't get a product at the end. At the opposite, when uh, a national lab in the US, for example, give an order to you, mm. you actually further the product that's going to be able to be useful for large enterprise telco television channels. So you're, you're getting help towards building program, products. And this is something that I think is uh, critical in the realm of sovereignty, that we need to help our nation's enterprise and technologies to really develop products that are useful for customers. Yeah, thank you, Jérôme. Um, I'll, I'll bounce to um, to uh, Nicolas. Nicolas, uh, are you here on stage with me? Um, yes, here you are. Uh, yeah, uh, so Nicolas, you, um, you, you, you are French, uh, you're, the, you're the French side of, of this uh, discussion. Uh, and you'll you'll talk with your uh, head of uh, as as the head of the president of the uh, IAB, uh, the French chapter of the IAB. Um, so I'd like to have your feedback on what Jérôme just said, and and I think he has much to say. We heard you a lot here in France recently about uh, more uh, the, the 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 soft side, the soft industry, and and uh, especially on on. on Apple and its new iOS. Maybe you can tell more about that later. Um, so, what's your reaction to what just Job just said? And maybe you can give just uh, a, a few words on what exactly uh, you do at the uh, IAB. Sure. Well, hi everyone, and, and thank you for the invitation, uh, Gilles. So, just to tell you a bit more about the IAB, uh, the, it's the Interactive Advertising Bureau. So it's uh, it's a worldwide uh, organization who aims to uh, create industry standard when it's come to online advertising. So basically, the, let's say that uh, online advertising is a very complex uh, industry where um, a lot of uh, actors are um, um, all connected and dependent to each other. And the IAB is creating the standard to make everything works. So. It's the language who is going to be used between two servers uh, um, at the opposite, you know, between the two uh, different countries to display an ad uh, on the website uh, when a user is uh, is, um, is just entering on a website on on a media, for example, or that's the size of the format of the uh, 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 the format uh, you of the ads you are seeing on the website, and more recently, for example. IAB is creating in Europe um, transparency and consent framework to make the different um, companies be able to be compliant to GDPR uh, and uh, on the privacy uh, matter. And, and to react on the on your on, on this topic on this very trendy topic about the digital sovereignty and. Uh, um, so there is different area of sovereignty we can talk about. I think there is three main issues we are seeing growing or we are already victim um, of it. The first one is, uh, um, is linked to the infrastructure. The second one is about law and regulation. And the third one is, is about uh, soft power of a country. So if I'm going back to infrastructure, um, but if you just check the history, as a, as a government, as a, uh, in the past, if you have a crisis, if you have a war, if you have a pandemic, you can you are mastering. You have the power on your infrastructure. You have a road, railways. You have uh, telcos, communication, media, because it's on your territory and it's your it's it's. Uh, it's a company who are based in your in your country or in your region. If we talk about Europe, uh, Europe, you have a power on it. So basically, and when you have a crisis, you can just um, uh, take this, uh, put your hands on it uh, because it's a matter of uh, it's a national matters, original matters. Mm -hmm. Today, what we are seeing with this uh, crisis, for example, we have several examples where we are discovering that. 
the in the digital matter, uh, all the online services are not French or European company anymore uh, because Europe lose the battle of of digital uh, of, of the last uh, 20 years basically. So. We have two uh, recent examples uh, in terms of uh, public when uh, our government um, made a, an app, Stop COVID, you know, a, a, track, a tracking app. They asked to Apple to make different changes uh, because they were concerned in terms of privacy and they didn't have the, the, the power and, and basically say no because they want to have something global. And in terms of transport as well, uh, when the Paris area which is one of the biggest uh, metro and, 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 and tube of the world. Um, we want to have their um, um, transport pass in by NFC in any uh, uh, Apple devices. Uh, Apple refused uh, basically to to bargain and, and to talk about uh, you know Apple if you pay and you want to reload your pass you have to pay a tax and and, and that was also uh, an issue. So that's about the infrastructure. Then you have the regulation and law. Every uh, country have an history and, uh, and, and made uh, um, about every law is made about uh, years of debates based on uh, democratic debates. And now basically what we are seeing is you have, when it's come to digital, you have guidelines, you have a, a big company who are reaching billions of people in the world who are applying the same global uh, regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes you have a country where alcohol is, 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 is forbidden at a certain uh, uh, age, or uh, uh, we don't, we, every country have a different, what is uh, nudity, for example, what you can show. We, have, we know the example of uh, uh, the, the paint of uh, uh, Courbet, uh, the origin du monde, for example, who have been, uh, um, uh, censored by by uh, by a platform. So and now you have a global platform which is not you have no access. Who just create a new law, his own law, his own regulation, and you you, you don't have access on that. And the last one is the soft power. And we, I think the example with Huawei and with Android is is the best one. Usually before when you have a commercial war. You, you, can, you know, you can use uh, the U.S. used to use the dollar, their money as a as a as a, as a very powerful um, uh, element of, of of soft power and sanction as well. But this time, they use the the, uh, the access to the user through the operating system and saying that Android is forbidden on uh, on the Huawei Ch Chinese based uh, uh, company. So you see, there are three different areas and definition of what we call, and it, I think it's a real problem for the next 10 years, if we, um, as we are not mastering, the state don't have any power anymore, it's come to digital, basically. Yeah, thank you, uh, Nicolas. Uh, Jérôme, do you agree with that? I well, mean, yes, but I would like sure to come back. The... I'd like to come back on the notion of soft power, because mm -hmm. I think that um, the soft power extends to the power of the consumers, and the the power of the public sector to place orders. Mm. So in the US, you all know that they have the Small Business Act, and truly uh, a lot of the US purchasing will favor US companies and US small companies. It's a reality in day-to-day -day life. And um, I think that we have been a little bit naive in Europe over the past 20 or 30 years when we uh, put together the, the codes of our pu public uh, tenders where we have been very much of a full uh, economic liberal inspiration, uh, really pushing open competition everywhere. And now when you have a public tender in Europe, it's very difficult and it's actually legally almost impossible to favor European companies. Mm -hmm. So you have in the US a small business act that will favor American company. You have in China a number of systems that will favor Chinese company. And Europe is open for all and is not favoring is its own children. It's on children. So I think that it's very important. And this applies both at a consumer level, that consumers be aware 
that when they buy locally, they foster the local economy and they foster employment locally, uh, and that governments and the whole public sector be more able to buy also locally. I mean, they, they, there's been a number of articles in the press over the past few weeks saying that they, we should find a way to direct more of the public spending towards um, French and European companies. Yeah, I, 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 as a business leader in France, do you agree with that? Yes, totally. I mean, it's a question of pro protectionism, basically. So mm. the, the whole thing, when we, if we talk about world trade, is about reciprocity. And today, Europe, it's it's just a market open to everyone. So you have you have basically, you know, what I've done, and you can really criticize it, but China, they create a wall. They have their own internet. And, and you know that Google, Facebook is forbidden. They create their own Amazon, their own Google, and their own uh, Facebook. You know, you have WeChat, you have Alibaba. And so they grow, they are powerful. And now what are they doing? They're just coming to... <laughs> to Europe, uh, yeah. but the reciprocity was not possible uh, mm. at this time. So yeah, it's the moment you really think about not having this, uh, this, 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 just having a market which is available to everyone. I think we are naive. I think it's what Jerome says is, uh, is totally true. And, and the fact that we, um, the, the TikTok example is a very good example. Of course. Uh, Donald mm. Trump just to offer to the US, maybe the next uh, social network mm -hmm. it can be even if it's not copied by uh, other company uh, and to slow them down. They, now there is a, an important part of, uh, of this really uh, um, fast growing uh, new uh, social media. And we know how it's important, how it's, when it's growing fast, it can be uh, the next thing uh, it by is uh, and I'm not making the apologize of Donald Trump here. Uh, uh, he, I'm just, it's just a fact that there is a, voluntar a political uh, voluntarism on this kind of thing. And I think as a European, we were just watching what's mm. happening without any even declaration about what we think about it and just le le let it happen. So it's really, and that's probably linked to uh, where we are in terms of construction of Europe. It's an in-between, mm -hmm. economic and political, maybe uh, uh, not enough strong politically to be, uh, to, to create really uh, action. Uh, and um, so it's, we are in, uh, an in-between, which is uh, basically for the moment, just a, mar a market. Um, at this point in time, I'd just like to remind our uh, audience that if you have questions, of course, do not hesitate, you folks, and I think you're following us on LinkedIn. Do not hesitate to ask your questions, and, and, and of course, we'll uh, answer these questions. Um, Nicola mentioned, said the word uh, protectionism. Is it protectionism or is it economic patriotism, as we say in France, patriotism economic? Uh, the nuance is very subtle, but uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, is there something positive in uh, who's right and, and who's wrong? I mean, should we do as uh, you know, Trump says, okay, you know, TikTok is not respecting the rules, or I, su I suspect them of not respecting the, ru the rules. Uh, and uh, by the way, they're, 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 they're treating our companies and tech companies in China very bad. So I'll do the same. You know, it's a kind of appliance. But uh, Jérôme, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, I'm I'm an optimist and I believe in peace. So I'm go, I'm going to go towards the peaceful solution rather than uh, go at war. So um, I, I like the idea of uh, patriotism uh, more than uh, protectionism. I think that uh, protectionism uh, always leads to wars. Um, but I want to to come back on this word I used that Nicola took again, a uh, naivety. I mean, uh, look, the the Gafa and especially. Uh, uh, Google and Facebook, uh, they, they're, they're not playing with the same rules. And, and we know that they are finding legal ways to evade European taxes that are, I mean, very, very sophisticated and working very well. And uh, when France decides to put a 3% tax on uh, revenue, which honestly, given how much money they make from a French citizen is totally reasonable. I mean, it's not like, you know, we're, we're doing a tax that is a uh, 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 confiscate, confiscating all their profit. I mean, it, it's completely reasonable. Mm. Uh, the reaction from the U.S. is to add a tax on wine. 
So uh, let, let, let's stop being naive. I mean, uh, we're, we're, there is some form of economic war. Now, I, rather than focusing on this, I would rather focus on what we can do positively. And the one thing that every one of us can do in uh, how we consume daily, what we buy, in uh, how we uh, um, promote government policies is to uh, indeed uh, be a little bit... Um, patriotic in, in, in the way we buy things uh, you know starts with cars I mean there's there's a, there's a really good car industry in France and Europe uh, one of the strongest in the world um, and I think that nowadays if you're European it's better to buy an electric car from a European manufacturer than a Tesla and maybe if we buy enough electric cars from them we'll push them to be able to develop a true competitor to Tesla because right now it's it's not yet the case um, so I think we need to be more careful again I, it really starts with each of us as a consumer and also the public sector uh, in how we buy. Mm -hmm. Nicolas, you want uh, yeah, to Yeah, I, think I could uh, agree more on, uh, on, uh, on, this, uh, on this point here. Um, you know, particularly, I'll uh, comment on what Jerome said and uh, totally agree. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned the, um, the regulation. I, I mean, can reg regulation be uh, uh, the, the, the key uh, solution when we see uh, what's going on here in Europe with, uh, with Facebook? Uh, uh, it, it, in a way, it's, it's, it's also, I mean, the, the uh, RGPD in, in France, uh, JDRP, we say it's in English, um, helped us maybe to... Uh, yeah, maybe to, to, to confront these, these big uh, tech American companies or Chinese companies. Um, how far can it protect us? I mean, uh, and, and is it enough to be protected? We also need to be offensive at one point, right? The, the regulation is always a tricky question because it could, if it's making, you have to do it, you have to make really good regulation because that's also, you know, it's like a coin if you are... Mm. Uh, sometimes it could uh, even be uh, the worst situation. Sometimes, even if the first goal uh, was good. So we, we, as you know, Thierry Breton, the new uh, commissioner, is really keen to work on a new uh, uh, European regulation called Digital Service Act. Mm -hmm. uh, from what we hear, it's really um, uh, targeting. Uh, digital platform also in, in, in the um, competition area. Um, there is a lot of question about self preferences, about, you know, if you have a certain size and a lot of company depend on you, maybe you have greater responsibility on the, how you should be able. Uh, the, the update you are making because you can destroy your jobs at the end in, in, in revenue. And we have a lot of example, unfortunately, um, uh, re recently in the past uh, 10 years around that. And if we talk about GDPR, for example, we could think that GDPR was a kind of protectionism. Imagine GDPR 20 years ago. Mm. It's, it's, it's really painful and taking a, t a lot of resources for a company to, to get compliant. But, to get, uh, but at, if we had GDPR 20 years ago, the, the, the Facebook, the Google, and the, all these online services will not enter the European market, not as fast as they have done. Why? Because they have to, first of all, they are concentrated on their own market, which is one of the biggest of the world. And they have to make a special effort to be compliant to enter in mm -hmm. European markets. And during this time, you can see European, uh, the European market creating their own uh, company. That's what we have seen with China, uh, mm -hmm. with their form of protectionism. So you could even think that. Um, today, unfortunately, uh, we, we are even seeing the opposite and the smaller players are even the one the most affected by this regulation, and it could even uh, reinforce the power of uh, some big big tech. So you see, regulation can be good. Sometimes can take times as well. <coughs> it will be, be effect in ten years, 
of, of GDPR, for example, as a protectionism uh, uh, law. But and we will see what DSA, the Digital Service Act, is going to be. But I think there is a kind of from Thierry Breton, the commissioner, a kind of uh, voluntarism in, in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the data is really key in that topic, right? And when you when it comes to to sovereignty, Jean, what do you think about? So oh, I think more about data than uh, than, mm. than regulation. And I, I, I actually am very skeptical about the power of regulation today. Um, you know, I, I I see the benefit of being conscious of the purchasing act. I see uh, the potential benefit and the risk of pro protectionism, but I fully agree with Nicolas. Um, no one can really see all the side effects of regulation now. The world is just too complex. Um, mm. uh, GDPR was actually a, a really not practical for a company of the size of Skeleti. And, uh, and I see in every discussion around uh, a, a public cloud and a federation of uh, European public clouds and what, what would be the standard for uh, public clouds that are considered sovereigns in, our, in Europe. Uh, honestly, uh, Amazon and uh, Microsoft and Google are incredibly good lobbyists. And in all of these discussions, they outnumber the Europeans. And so they're going to find ways to define, or they, 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 they will push the commission to, find, to define sovereignty in a way that their clan can be considered a sovereign uh, in Europe. I think that one thing that would, um, mm. would be very powerful, but it, it's not in our capability in Europe, but uh, is if at some point uh, the, the big players in the US feel the pressure uh, of not doing enough business in Europe because of the American Cloud Act. For, for me, the real problem with cloud is the American Cloud Act that essentially uh, allows uh, U.S. authorities to look at the content of any cloud that is owned by an American company where it, wherever it is in the, in the world. Um, the, the rest, for me, is actually not as bad and, and a, a level of risk that we've been living with with, with, a, lot, with a long time. But that cloud act is very special because it allows um, uh, U.S. agencies to look at any content anywhere in the world. Um, so there could be, you, we could imagine a pressure from uh, the large American companies uh, who want to do more business in Europe to get out of this cloud act in some way. Uh, and, I've, you know, in the realm of, of regulation, that would be a significant change. Hmm. Nicolas, you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, but it's a question of the, you know, the, the, the the really recent question about yeah. the, the, the privacy shield. And uh, in fact, it's always, it's a question of reciprocity again mm -hmm. um, and, and access to data. And that's probably one of the, basically that what um, the, the TikTok thing uh, is a question of uh, reciprocity. So mm -hmm. I, what I understand what basically is saying uh, Donald Trump is that I don't want you to have access. Uh, I, I don't want China. To have access to uh, U.S. citizen uh, data, uh, mm. but, uh, and the because the probably because the reciprocity is not true because uh, U.S. don't have uh, access to uh, true uh, uh, big tech or U.S. company to their because there is a big wall garden around the Chinese internet. So mm. um, yeah, the question of access to data is. Uh, of cloud data center is, is also key in this, uh, in this matter. Um, I'd like to, to, to take another angle uh, in our discussion here. Um, last week, um, a company called Snowflake uh, went public uh, and, and you know, made a big score, right? Uh, they, they, they were nearly, uh, I think, seven, $70 billion uh, in valuation uh, on the first day. Uh, and this company was created by uh, two French guys. Uh, they were trained here. Uh, they had uh, they graduated, graduated here in France and then moved to Silicon Valley in, in, in uh, the mid '90s. And and of course, we know the, the big success of Snowflake. That, that, that's you know that's a little pain for for us in France to see that we weren't able in in maybe 25 years ago. We 
uh, weren't able to to keep these guys here and 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 to uh, fund the, this company uh, uh, in, in France. We could say the, the same thing about another guy called Jérôme Lucas with uh, Scality, right? Uh, you could have um, maybe... No, 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 you cannot say this because... Yeah, you tell us the story no, differently. No, 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 I have to stop you there. You cannot say this with Scality because Scality is a French essay. It's a French company. So I moved uh -huh. here. I'm managing the company from here, but I kept the company a French company. It's a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm. But um, so this is was there was the first part of you know the kind of frustration right with 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 uh, Snowflake and the other part of the question is another company uh, raised uh, called Miracle another French company raised three hundred million dollars uh, this week uh, with basically uh, you know uh, European funds yeah. and and one big British uh, fund. Uh, so what does this tell? I mean, is, is, is things changing? Um, how it's can you, you know... question of times. It's about are we going to, uh, what is going to happen in the next 10 years? Because it's, mm. it's a vicious circle. Uh, mm. It's because you have champions um, in, in France, in Paris, in Europe, that you can attract and pay the best talent of the world including, because we are lucky in France, we have great in, in, in engineer um, uh, to keep the best engineer and best talent in France. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you protect uh, or, or, or try to um, number of, of startup scale-up uh, unicorn you have, and then you have a really positive cycle, which is great in because you can pay well people, mm -hmm. keep you need to have a project and then we will we will we will uh it's gonna take times and we have a lot to catch up the the, the, the step is uh is yeah. very, i don't know what you think uh, jerome uh, but this uh, I, I, I think that de definitely things have changed over the past uh, 15 years i mean uh, the, the topic you're addressing here is exactly the reason why i addressed this letter to francois hollande in 2014 and um, you know, if, if you look back, I, I moved to the U.S. in 2006 and, you know, at the time it was not very happy to be an entrepreneur in France. Uh, okay, so there was not much money. There was some money. Uh, there was some money uh, since uh, Dominique Roscan. So there, there was money, but you, you were not appreciated. Uh, the, the market there was very much limiting your ambition. Um, mm. it, it was very difficult to dream big in France. Now it's completely changed, completely changed. I mean, mm -hmm. even we, we have a president of the Republic, uh, Macron, who first of all speaks English. I mean, that, that's a big change in itself. And the second, uh, he, he tells entrepreneurs, go build a unicorn and don't let anyone stop you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a huge difference with 20 years ago. So, yeah, I think, it, I think it's possible. Um, I think, obviously, we know this. We're still lacking uh, big companies and, and exits and and companies that are able to buy other companies, because if you look at how the Silicon Valley uh, built itself, it really built around its own first success. So you had HP, then Intel, and then HP and Intel were able to buy other companies. And now, uh, you know, Google, uh, Cisco buy companies, and that fuels uh, because you need to, you need financially uh, the investors to make money. Facebook also has been buying quite a few companies. Um, so. I think that we're early in the circle, but there's been something like, what, 7 billion euros invested in the past uh, five years. Um, making, building a unicorn costs, in, in average, $300 million, okay? So you, you needed this financing, and then it takes seven years. So in average, you need $300 million and seven years to build a unicorn. It, it takes time, but the process is very well engaged. I'm very hopeful. Yeah, um, just, just if I have to add something, is you're right. It's. It's. Uh, I remember uh, ten years ago, um, raising uh, fifteen million in France was uh, a record. It's not the case anymore. So the, the, the money is here. The, the, the also thing is, we when we build the unicorn, we have to to keep it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the thing is, well, because I'm talking about the advert, I'm thinking about the advertising market, which is uh, what is 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 looking for, and we have a lot of of expertise on the advertising market. On mobile as well, but all the players today are very dependent from uh, other company and big tech who can make some move and and totally destroy them and kill them. It's the, the uh, Apple, for example, is is um, announcing a move 
uh, applying a new just change the rules recently and uh, announced that early in, uh, next year they will make an update of their uh, operating system mm -hmm. just kill or, or very impact a business of a lot of of company in their own interest uh, strangely uh, um, and 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 at the end that could kill some new uh, unicorn we have so it's also mm -hmm. about if there is not the regulation who are going to protect those companies, we can create it, but at some point they could be, uh, as sometimes they are de dependent on others, um, it's important also to, to protect them. Um, no, sure. I'd like to take a question from uh, from, from um, uh, He says, too much taxes in France, not recognized enough. Is it still true today? So he says too much taxes in France? Too much taxes in France. Uh, taxes. I pay more. I pay more taxes in California than in France. Maybe, uh, maybe you know, not just private, but professional also. You know, professionally. I mean, co corporate taxes. No, 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 no. They, 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 this, this is completely wrong. You need to look at the numbers. So yes, specifically that one tax bracket. If you are a company that makes hundreds of millions of dollars, you get a higher profit tax in France. Most of the companies we talk about, they're not making hundreds of million dollars of profit. So this, this is not the problem. And specifically, California, which is the place in the U.S. where there's been the most wealth creation in tech, has the highest tax rate in, in the U.S. and has a much higher tax rate for individuals than uh, France. Um, mm -hmm. So taxes and, uh, and by the way, employee tax. I mean, people talk to me about employee tax in France. Yeah, you have employee tax in France, but you don't have to buy uh, health for your employees yeah. and retirement for your employees. If you look at the fully loaded cost of an engineer and compare Paris with San Francisco, an engineer cost me twice as much in San Francisco than Paris, twice mm -hmm. as much. Uh, so no, taxes is not the problem. Mm -hmm. Nicola? No, I think, uh, um, I, I'm not sure it's the, yeah, it's the, 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 the main problem uh, uh, here mm, on this point. After there is a question of, um, you know, there is the digital tax, question <laughs> in yeah. Europe for this reason, which is a, a total different aspect, but that just the fact yeah, that of course. Mm. when you're a global company, you could have, uh, you, you can make some, um, some um, uh, fiscal, um, uh, let's say, and at the end pay, pay less tax in the, than uh, the other, who are smaller and will not have the, the size to organize this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, tax uh, rebate. Um, we, we've talked about that earlier, but Alexis Bordet would like to, you to answer more precisely on uh, the decision um, of EU to restrict data uh, transfer between uh, EU and US and uh, maybe mandate server presence in EU like China. What, what do you think, um, John? Well, so, so our, our job at Scality is uh, to sell a software to allow our customers to build a private cloud. Um, so why would anyone do this? I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, our customers are all the people who chose to not use the public cloud. And essentially because they have a fuzzy feeling that if they go and put all of their business on the public cloud, they become at the mercy of the public cloud um, in terms of regulation change, also in terms of price change, in terms of policy change. So I think that uh, what I'm seeing, and, and honestly, we're making a business out of it, is that pe people, people, enterprises, and governments, they're not fools. And what they're building is infrastructures where some of their infrastructure can stay wherever they decide, in country, in Europe, in region. Uh, and some of their infrastructure will benefit from the public cloud where they really cannot really control what's going to happen with the data in terms of location or policies. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think that, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a strong believer in regulation. I think that that is going to be the dominant architecture because people want to retain control. And I think it's very good this way. Mm -hmm. Nicola, you want to? No, I think uh, we, I talked previously about the, the thing about privacy shield and, um, <coughs> and, and, and the, 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 one of the problem of regulation is all the time we spend by the company to uh, <laughs> on, on this mm -hmm. kind of matter where they are, it's not the time they are spending on innovation. Um, and, and when you're a smaller company, uh, you don't have the same uh, legal services. 
to take care of this kind of thing. And uh, so you have to focus a lot. It's not the same effort, obviously. So um, everything around any ch all the change. I mean, the company wants legal security, and they just want to. Just, and, and and what we see, uh, what, what we are seeing today, it's it's always moving, and it, you, we can understand it's uh, it's not a mature market, so it's quite new. So you, the regulation is coming with the um, with this now, where before it was only growing, and we don't really matter in terms of regulation. So we could we can understand as well. So it's it's it can be very painful for. For, for companies and the important, what is important in terms of competition is, is to be sure that we are either not applying the same uh, rules for smaller companies than big companies or um, be sure that, you know, in terms of markets, uh, when a, a, a region like France or, or Europe is spending a lot of time in, uh, in um, Compliancy, for example, and not the company, but that's slowing down uh, innovation as well. That's something we have to keep in mind, um, of course. Yeah, yeah um, Fabrice Chapier wants to know what you think about the, the rise of the Russians and uh, and the Chinese in these arena. So that's interesting for Europeans, of course, because we don't have any social networks, and and that's so we don't have any competitors in that um, in, in that field, but. Um, uh, yeah, well, more and more we see uh, the, the Chinese uh, addressing exactly the same markets and, and the same kind of population that you know, these, these big um, tech companies, American companies, have uh, had as you know as, as their own market for, 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 for a long time. Well, since the, the the theme today is about sovereignty, and given the situation where you know, in the past 20 years, there's been one superpower that was an absolute leader in this whole internet thing, and it's uh, the US. And given the fact that uh, Europe is not, uh, you know, a leader, mm -hmm. we're rather a challenger. Um, it, it, you know, from that perspective, it's good for us that there's more challengers. So the, the rise of China for Europe is definitely an opportunity. And I think that there are opportunities for, for China and Europe to find ways to uh, work together um and uh you know we shouldn't be naive um Ch china is um very power hungry and they're very productive of their of their area but at the same time china is incredibly uh business driven and business minded so there, there must be ways to work with china another question from um elizabeth Alefloc. uh more on education can education be uh, also a uh, a mean of of uh, enforcing your your sovereignty uh, is is does it, do you think it should be taken into account, Nicolas, Jérôme? Jérôme, are you more inspired than me? Um, yeah, education and culture. <laughs> I mean, there, there, there's no doubt that um, you know if you look at uh, if you look at China, if you look at the U.S. Um, People there are very naturally patriotic and they, f they think it's normal to be. I mean, you, you go in any neighborhood in the U.S. and you see a lot of American flags. And uh, in Europe, we tend to be uh, very shy of any patriotism. Uh, actually, the, the word chauvin en français is, is a negative connotation word. Okay, why? Um, mm -hmm. so I think that from this standpoint, uh, education has a big role to play. Um, we should be proud. And we should be proud of being who we are and at the same time be citizens of the world. Mm. And, 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 you know, I, I said earlier, I'm, I'm always for uh, solutions that are peace-oriented and, and war-oriented. I think it's completely possible to, at the same time, be very respectful of the, the culture, the diversity of the world, be respectful of other cultures and be proud of your own and do some preference in the way you buy locally. Mm. Alexis Roulier is a, a, a French entrepreneur and he wants, uh, so that's, you know, we're a little bit uh, um, aside of the, of the topic, but it's, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the question to you both because you probably have some uh, uh, pieces of advice to give him. He wants to know as a young entrepreneur, uh, you know, 
in, the, in this very uh, difficult time, um, what can you what can you uh, advise him to do? Uh, what kind of financial advices could you give him, and where can he find some you know help and and uh, and support? No, that's that's sorry again, uh, Jérôme. I, I'm not an entrepreneur. I would I would love to, but uh, I'm a, I'm an employee today. What if you were an entrepreneur, uh, Nicolas? Maybe you. What, what would you do in this? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I'm not going to. I can't give advice here because. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, especially in the in this time, and I've gone through three crises, so you you mm. get you. Um, you know, I'm going to say something that may sound funny, but I would say start by meditating. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, when, when you're uh, the head of a, you're an entrepreneur with a business that is really struggling because there's, the world is falling around you, you're receiving mm -hmm. hundreds of advice, you're hearing TV and, 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 and TV is just counting the death day after day. Uh, it's really difficult to, to think straight. So the first thing I would advise is, Take some time alone and think for yourself what you really believe. First of all, I mean, I'm going to ask a really blunt question. Is your startup still meaningful in this world? What you created two years ago, does it still make sense in the world of after? Um, if it does, go for it and find ways. If it doesn't, mm -hmm. change project now. But look at it by yourself. Take advice, but don't listen to advice. You need to fill your guts and feel what you really want to do. And uh, the, the other thing I would like to say is, if you really believe that this company has a meaning in the world, mm. go for it and find a way, and there's always a path. And, and you know, this is me saying this, and again, I've gone through free crisis, and I've managed uh, companies that had no cash for payroll in two weeks, and, and we've managed through. It's all, there's always mm. a path if you believe in it. So oh, we've talked a lot about sovereignty. Maybe we can have um, end this session with a um, you know uh, more uh, kind of uh, positive and 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 uh, you know give us some positive energy and see how we can uh, together on both sides uh, of of the Atlantic and maybe also with China. I mean, uh, we will have to deal with that, right? We can just keep uh, China and and the U.S. away. Uh, when you're in Europe, you can. In the U.S. difficult. I mean, is it possible also to keep China and Europe away? We don't even really know. Also, want to keep the, the one of the, the two of the best um, of the biggest markets on the, in, in, on, on this planet, uh, consumer markets. So, how can we try to to, to work together uh, uh, efficiently and and uh, making uh, everybody happy? I think, but I think Jerome talked about something. Uh, about being peaceful and uh, being a citizen of the world is is it's uh, we talk economics so there is obviously competition but at the end uh, um, it's a, it's a global uh, mm -hmm. talking about a global economy so it's true that it's just that we should not be naive um, but at the end if we want to succeed we are happy to uh, to to have a great company in go uh, as mm -hmm. or, or other company uh, to conquer other markets as well. Uh, the, the question is having the same chance um, uh, at the end. And, and speci specifically in this really uh, weird time, I'm not sure that the, when the relationship between America today and, uh, and France are at, at, the at, at the best in terms of uh, political situation. We will see after the election uh, if it's changing a bit. But that's the moment where, if government are not on the, on the best situation, we should uh, people should link and and be very close and and business and and business dependency as well is probably the, the most uh, powerful thing we can do in terms of peace. That's that that's I was critiz uh, I was saying that European Union is is only a market, but the the codependency co on every country of the European Union. And making a peaceful place uh, in the world as well. So um, to finish on a positive area, what we are doing and making business on the other side of the Atlantic is creating link between people, um, and that will avoid any kind of even 
even in the, the worst uh, crisis you can have, because there is a lot of interest and business interest that creating bridge who could uh, really um, uh, save the relationship, even if we have a crisis, even if we have uh, two mandates of uh, 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 with presidents who are, have very different interests. Uh, that's that's a protection as well because the transatlantic relationship uh, should uh, I mean the history of France and America are, are, are if we think about Lafayette and are, are very deep and mm -hmm. very very old as well and making business pro protecting us from this relationship even if we can have all political crises uh, of the world so I think that what we are doing when we do uh, uh, business as well. And uh, that's that's really the positive point as well. Mm. John? Well, yeah, I mean, I fully agree with Nicolas. I mean, I think that the, the relationship between uh, US and France is uh, very old, deeply rooted and very strong. Um, you know, people, people here in the US absolutely admire France, uh, remember Lafayette, uh, and, um, and, you know, France has helped the US become what it is, and the US has helped France stay uh, what it is. I mean, they, they came and rescued us, uh, rescued us in the First World War and the Second World War. Let's not forget mm -hmm. that. And, you know, I'm absolutely convinced that if there were a Third World War, the US would come again. So th th mm -hmm. this is a very strong advice. I think that, that France has a unique, um, unique advantage that we're probably not leveraging enough is that many cultures around the world, and that includes uh, China, loves France. I mean, look how many tourists we have uh, normally awesome. from China. So when, when as, a, as a French business, you go abroad, you're actually welcome and, and, and very much so, and you're loved, and people want to come to France and visit you. Uh, and I see this, uh, you know, Skeleti sells in 36 countries in the world. I see this wherever I travel. People are super <laughs> happy to see me. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to finish on a, on a positive note, um, I will restate Skeleti is a French company and we've just done a 60% growth this year in, in this very weird time. Uh, yeah. So wow. let's, let's continue and, uh, and, and let's push on this fact that, uh, you know, France as a country, as a culture is very much light in the world. Let's be world citizen and establish more ties with more countries um, providing what they, what they like from the culture. That's a great uh, soft power. The diplomacy of uh, white cheese is, is, is uh, always working. Okay. okay. Well, thank you um, to you both. It was um, uh, really nice to have you. Th sorry for the uh, little um, technical problems we had uh, at the beginning of, uh, of of this session, but it uh, it went, uh, I hope, smoothly. Uh, afterwards and and uh, thanks again i uh, hope to, uh, we can uh, have you um, again on on our on our show uh, and uh, well laurence i'll uh, leave you the last word uh, and uh, and uh, the stage by the way thank you very much for your time and i uh, hope to uh, see you next time on our next session Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you the, to the speakers for, for this great discussion. Thank you, Gilles, for, for the moderation. Um, well, as a conclusion, we can say that, you know, uh, France is a country of, uh, of wine, as, as Nicola was saying, but also Silicon Valley and California. So the next topic actually will be with two winemakers, um, Pauline Lott, uh, who is winemaker uh, in, uh, in California, um, and uh, Julia, who is a winemaker in France, so uh, of LVMH. So this is the, the next topic of, of uh, France versus California and Silicon Valley this time. But so thank you very much to Jérôme and Nicolas for this very uh, insightful discussion. Uh, I think we learned a lot. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. Feel free also to send us any topics that you would like to us to cover. Uh, we have many more to come. Um, but, uh, but it was a great session and, and we're very glad to be, to be live uh, on LinkedIn this time. So um, I think we'll, we'll do that again so thank you all and uh, and have a, a good night good weekend for for friends and uh, and a good day for for california thank you all bye, -bye. thank you bye everyone